Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making this one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. At the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine, a lot of the talk this year has been on GLP-1 drugs. Now, we've talked about these in the past, but I wanted to bring a new face to our conversation. And with that, we welcome Dr. Ben Yurick to the Exam Room. Thanks for making time, my friend. Absolutely. It's great to be here. Great to have you here. Sharp dressed man, I, I no, appreciate I what you bring to the table. That. Very yeah. good. You Absolutely. as well. Thank you. It's it's kind like, of my shtick, but I like it when you know people. You know, I like what you got going on. I YouTube. try. I yeah, try. You succeed, sir. <laughs> you succeed. So, uh, GLP ones. First of all, it seems to me like they are still exploding in popularity. Yeah. How? Yeah. How many people are are using GLP one drugs right now? That's a great question. So, so just to as a, as by way of a bit more background. So, so my role, I am the senior director of health outcomes at Prime Therapeutics. Mm -hmm. We are a pharmacy benefit manager owned by nineteen different Blue Cross Blue Shield plans. So, we ourselves are for profit, but we are owned by nonprofits. We are not publicly traded, et cetera, et cetera, which is which is kind of a nice space to be. Um, we are uh, we are seeing the 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 use of these products um, sort of explode to use a non-scientific term right so we uh for example within the data that we have when we looked at this in 2021 we were able to identify 4,000 people within a cohort of members who had uh obesity did not have diabetes we could see about 4,000 people once we sort of worked all the way down in our attrition who initiated these products that has now more than uh about quintupled in more recent periods mm. and you see so we have probably fairly restrictive criteria but we see this uh, exploding in sort of an exponential rate and a lot of this depends on sort of where people have benefits through. Um, if you are in the sort of large employer space, um, big, big increases in use in the large employer space. Don't have anything in terms of like actual numbers of, of people we're talking about, tens to hundreds of thousands of people using these products at this point in time for obesity, which is which is um, incredible considering where we were, you know, four years ago where this where use was 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 present, but but only had just started to take off with the introduction of Wegovi in uh, November of um, 2021. So it's been... Just an enormous increase in the use of these products in a short period of time. What do we know about the efficacy of them? I've heard kind of mixed results in that most people are using them short term and they either get off of them because they don't like the side effects or that's cost prohibitive. And so maybe we're looking at a year or two tops. What does your data show in that regard? Yeah. So so what I heard from there were sort of two questions. One is like, how long do people typically stay on these products? Yeah. And so then given that we have seen within sort of some of the prior work that we have done and others have done that people tend to discontinue these products within the first year, what does that mean from an efficacy perspective? Mm. So sort of taking those things kind of side by side, number one, we're talking about how long these people stay on these products. Um, we refer to that in the, in the research world as persistence, right? So how long does a person persist? Um, we saw that among people who initiated these products in 2021, again, this was people um, with obesity, without diabetes, who were using any GLP-1, sort of both on-label and off-label, we saw that only up to about 25, 30% of people actually stayed on these products for a full year, mm. Mm. Um, which was, which was you know, somewhat surprising, right? Yeah. Now, um, it, persistence rate among any new medication isn't great, right? It is certainly not 100%. Um, we, 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 we would have expected it would have been, you know, well north of, of 50%, right? If this is sort of a typical product. Um, if you look more recently, and when we looked at this more recently, we now have switched to people who, who do not have diabetes and are using one of the, uh, obesity indicated products, which is really limiting it down to high intent, uh, high potency obesity indicated products, which is the, um, Wegovi and Zepbound, Right. If we see among Wegovy and Zepbon users, that persistence, that which was about 30%, is now over 60%. Wow. So that's been an enormous change in the persistence among people who do have access to these products. So we, you know, you're looking at that and you're trying to ask you, trying to answer you the question, why do we see so much higher persistence today than we did in years past? And so we think part of the reason is due to increased availability of these products. Mm. Um, widely known that there were shortages in Wegovy, you know, 2022, 23, 24. A lot of these shortages resolved as we get farther into 2024. But certainly when you're looking at 2023, a lot of shortages of these products. You had a lot of increase in compounding of these products. You wouldn't have the possibility of compounding if there were no shortages, you know. Mm -hmm. So we know that there are major shortages of these products. And so once you get to a point where people can initiate a product and stay on it because it's continuously available, you're going to see higher persistence. Another thing we see 
within our data is a relationship between persistence and side effects. So those who have side effects tend to not persist as long as those who do not have side effects, which, of course, makes sense. Of course. Um, and so we think side effects are something that, 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 is, that is affecting this. It's not why you've seen necessarily this increase in persistence, although somewhat counterintuitively, you know, even with the same sort of side effects, right? So the n- same number of people getting nausea and vomiting from these drugs, we think that there's been an increase in um, sort of physicians uh, understanding of how to manage these products, mm-hmm. which sort of manifests itself in setting expectations from the beginning. If a physician prescribes you a Govi and says, you are probably not going to feel great for the next couple of months, but if you stick with it, people tend to do better. Hmm. That tells you, okay, this nausea and vomiting that I'm having right now, if I persist, it's going to get better, right? If you have that knowledge from the beginning, you're more likely to stick with it. Also, we, we are seeing reports of, of physicians prescribing things like, like Zofran, like active measures to try to address nausea and vomiting. Anti-nausea medicine. Yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. Yep. Uh, on Dancitron, the, the, the generic name of it. Um, and so, you know, prescriptions for, for, for that medication can help to, again, sort of mitigate some of these side effects in the short term, which can help to increase long-term persistence. So we think that, that side effects are having a, a role here. And then also coverage of these medications. And so, you know, for people who initiated in 2021, I don't have full details on coverage, but you did have, um, uh, again, our, our clients are Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance plans. And they represent 19 different states. And so a lot of this depended based on the different Blue Cross Blue Shield insurers. But you did have some plans which had um, sort of relatively generous legacy coverage of mm. weight loss medications. Yeah. If you're thinking about sort of the average spending on like a, like a per member per month basis, which is sort of how we sort of think about this. If you're talking about you give people access to weight loss products and the average, you know, uh, cost is like a dollar per member per month. You know, the average person over a year spends, you know, maybe $10, $15 on weight loss medications. Um, that's not that's not that much. That doesn't keep anybody up at night. Right. You get a GLP-1 for weight loss coming on the market. Now you're talking about um, $20 to $30 uh, every month for the entire population yeah. that is using these, uh, the, the, the entire population. Um, we've seen some groups that don't have very much sort of controls on this. Um, we have seen um, spending increases uh, above $50 just for weight loss GLP-1s alone mm. on, a, on a per person per month basis which when you're talking about the average sort of plan maybe spends 150 to $200 um, per, mer- per person per month on all drugs, yeah, $50 for just weight loss drugs, that's a really hard, that's a really, it's a really hard sort of pill to swallow. Right. And so um, we have seen some, some pullback in coverage of these medications and that reduction in coverage can of course lead to uh, reductions in, in persistence, although again, we haven't studied that specifically. That is a very thorough answer. I like that. It's, it's, yeah, it's I what mean, we do. You unpacked it. That is, I mean, you are a, <laughs> holy smokes. Oh, man, I'm scared to actually ask you another question, uh, but I will. Excellent. Um, do you have any data on, so you say that uh, you represent, or yeah, you represent, uh, what, 19 states is, is where the coverage is? Correct. Are you able to say, like, because there is a, a swath of the U.S. known as the obesity belt, is there in those regions higher rates of people using these drugs versus maybe something in the Northeast or out in California or someplace like that? We do see, um, we, we do see differences in, in utilization by region. Um, we have, um, we represent plans in Illinois, Texas, Florida, a few plans in the Northeast, particularly New Jersey, um, also Washington, Oregon, um, you know, Wyoming as well, and, and a few other states. And so we do have some, some uh, regional spread. Um, I can't speak to our own data on this, but what we've seen, generally speaking, is while the Southeast does have the highest sort of population rates of obesity, mm. it's not necessarily where you've seen the greatest uptick, right? Because mm. it's sort of what you're looking at in terms of, of use is number of people who can use it times among those who can use it, the number who actually do, right? right. So that uptake hasn't been quite as great necessarily regionally. This is, not, again, not necessarily with our data, but what's been reported more broadly. Um, looking at the Northeast, there have been some reports that those who do have obesity are um more are, are, are you sort of using these products at a greater rate? Um, we don't have any representation within our data from from the state of New York, but there has been some reports kind of from from jurors who do that you do see sort of greater rates of use among um, those who have obesity. And so that tends to sort of push utilization up above where you would necessarily expect it, even though population rates of obesity are not as great. Maybe you don't have this data, maybe you do. Do you have any sort of idea in terms of how well these drugs uh, perform if paired with, you know, lifestyle and nutritional interventions as well? That's a great question. Yeah. So 
the clinical trials for these products did pair these drugs with lifestyle nutrition interventions. Um, from that clinical trial data, we we would we would therefore say that that the sort of the the best context in you know to to use these medications um, is uh, in the setting of sort of you know diet and lifestyle changes. Right, mm-hmm. it's not to use these medications and use these medications alone. In that sense, it is you know very similar to anything else that you're trying to improve cardiometabolic risk. Right, like the recommendations for statins aren't just like you know take your uh, torvastatin and do nothing else, right? Like you, like you do want to combine, you know, medications like this with lifestyle and diet changes to, to improve overall health, right? Um, We, as a part of coverage criteria, um, that, that does vary by, by um, plan. One uh, option that's increasingly common, so we have it for our own employees at Prime Therapeutics, and we are also offering this to to others. This is not a plug for this, I'm just an example mm-hmm. of it, uh, is a program called KeepWell. And so KeepWell uh, partners with a couple of different vendors that create access to GLP-1 products paired with dietary and lifestyle changes. And so members have to log in on a monthly basis. They have to participate in this program. Um, they have to to sort of you know walk through um, counseling on on again these diet and lifestyle changes. If it is determined by a prescriber associated with that program that um, they do actually need a GLP one product, that person can be switched over to a GLP one product to use that in conjunction with these diet and lifestyle changes. And we think from a clinical perspective that that is really the most appropriate um, approach because again that is how it was studied and that is how it's sort of been proven to be most uh, effective. We're expecting. And that's the royal way that the rate of usage of these drugs is going to continue to increase. It yeah. just seems like that's that's not slowing down anytime soon. So I guess, you know, what does the future hold for these things? Like where where are we going with these? Is this gonna be like, you know, the first first line of defense for obesity, for diabetes, for anything that they're traditionally being prescribed for? What are we expecting? It's a really interesting question. So we, again, within our data, um, we're looking at uh, use of ZepBound. So we have to look about a year and a little bit of change um, out from anybody who we can sort of uh, initialize in our data. And so as we move forward in time, we're now into the first quarter, second quarter of 2024 is sort of what we can observe most clearly. And we see ZepBound use just in continuing to increase. I mean, at, at, I mean, at an exponential rate. Um, at some point in time, this has to at some point in time, this has to plateau, you would think. We are not, we are not, um, so it, it's probably um, sigmoid, right, in nature. So we are, we are right here on the, on the upward uh, trajectory of yeah. this. This yeah. will probably level off at some point in time, but yeah. we don't know when that point is. Right. We are getting asked all the time by, by employer groups and others, and we don't know when that point, when that point is. Um, there are other teams that are actually doing those projections on sort of, of use besides ours. We're really looking at the effectiveness and things like that within our data. Um, but uh, that is just of the of the products we have currently. So so uh, semaglutide and terzepatide, you know those those products that are indicated for weight loss and are used in that setting. The pipeline in this is really impressive, mm. right? Like you have a market this large, you have proven that people are willing to inject themselves on a weekly basis if you can get the effectiveness up past a certain point. Yeah, that brings a lot of funding. And that brings a lot of innovation to this. And so the the, the pipeline for for um, weight loss products is is vast. I think they're the last time I looked at this, um, and this does change regularly. But there are about thirty different products that were in the pipeline for this. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, of course, different uh, sort of similar GLP one and and GIP uh, agonists that are in development. So those would be direct competitors to, to semaglutide and trisepatide and may have similar um, sort of you know mechanisms of delivery, which is to say injectable. Um, there are also some some more oral formulations that are being uh, uh, introduced. There are some oral products that work with different mechanisms that are also in different phases. Um, Pfizer actually had a, an oral product that that made it to phase three and failed recently. Uh, but you are going to see uh, a much sort of broader uh, portfolio of products um, in, into sort of 2026 and and beyond. And so it's hard to say how the impact of those different products are going to affect this marketplace, but there certainly will be an impact on there. It may be that um, we're looking at something more like the Hep C products, where like Savaldi made a big splash. There was a ton of spend on Savaldi, a lot of a lot of um, media uh, attention focused on that. 
um, but Tavaldi isn't used anymore at all. Right. And we're, we're now on a sort of the, the, the second and third generation products of, of, um, of uh, you know, hep C antivirals that, that are actually being used in the market right now, that, right. that are more effective and more tolerated, et cetera. And so you may see um, those sort of dynamics play out within, within the, um, within the uh, um, GLP-1 and some of their products for, for weight loss space, but it's, it's, really hard to, it's really hard to say. And I guess it's way too early to be able to say whether or not maybe some of those oral medications that are kind of, uh, going to come into market, um, what their rate of efficacy would be compared to the injectables, right? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, so so there is a there is an oral semaglutide product by Belsus um, efficacy. So so um, my understanding of the clinical trial data for Belsus is a little bit weaker. But in general, um, efficacy was not as great with with uh, Ribelsus, and there was certainly patient reports of greater um, GI side effects because the dose that you have to have of semaglutide for Ribelsus is so much higher. Um, because n- very little of it actually passes through the gut. And so mm-hmm. you have to give a lot more of it because you expect only a fraction of it to actually make it through the gut and get into the bloodstream. And so as a result of that, you have to sort of be exposed to a lot more semaglutide, um, and that can create some additional um, side effects as well. So um, it, it'll be it'll be really, really interesting to see how these dynamics, you know, progress. Yeah, uh, it is it is fascinating to me whether you fall into the camp of someone who thinks that it should be done exclusively through diet uh, versus, you know, somebody who's open to using therapeutics. I, I I just think that we live, not to get on a soapbox, in a, in a nation that needs a lot of help. And True. so, you know, even if this is just a, a starting off point, a jumping off point for people, then use that. But I think that, you know, I can't speak for anybody else, but when paired with the lifestyle, the diet interventions, you know, these are, are quite powerful tools. And I don't have a leg to stand on as somebody who had weight loss surgery 15 years ago, you know, used to be 420 pounds. Goodness. That was just the start. That yeah. was just the start. And so it is, you know, exciting to see a little bit of help for somebody, you know, sure. as as they just get going. So um, you're a fascinating individual, man, and certainly you have a wealth of information in that that brain of yours, man. You are a numbers guy, and uh, someday I'll sit down and look at an exper- Excel spreadsheet <laughs> and have you ex- explain it all to me, man. But uh, this has been really great. Thank you, Dr. Absolutely. Thank you.